Welcome to Written and Read by, Episode 3, Deceit, by Nick Lamandola. Second floor had a real bad draft. Frank, two weeks later, who still wouldn't admit he'd seen or heard anything unusual. Is that really all you can recall? The reporter pressed him. Frank's face remained blank. It was a look he'd perfected after decades of practice. Mr. DePola, real estate agent Linda Donahue was found early this morning in the driver's seat of her Cadillac, which had crashed at significant speed into the front steps of the house. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Do you have any comment? Frank looked away, thinking about shriveled seals peeling away from panes of old wooden windows. He'd been hoping they had come here to tell him they'd found Joey. Frank pointed his flashlight at a corner of the underside of the porch, and Joey, behind him, scratched something down on his pad. Frank shimmied on his back, grunting, through the opening in the crawl space. Dead leaves crunched beneath him as he rolled over onto his knees. It began as a premonition, and then it was gone, like it had never been. Squirrels. Frank mumbled to himself. The two of them walked up the driveway and entered the house through the side door. Linda inhaled the smell of the lake in winter. Setting sunlight tumbled over the horizon and onto the house's western face. She sighed, and the fog of her breath shimmered a rainbow. Nervous already. Up went her defenses. Mm, Quite a project, she tisked, readjusting the hang of her scarf. Her heels clacked their way up the front steps. Chris opened his door before his car had fully stopped, shifting into reverse with his left foot pressed into the clutch like a throat. Reverse the transmission's largest gear ratio because it made the wheels more difficult to turn. Always in the back of his mind, the quavering thought that he'd glance backwards at it, crawling pilotless away from him, or find it later, glittering and overturned in a ditch across the road. He yanked upwards on the parking brake, redundantly, and ducked his head as he vaulted out of the cabin. His knees straightened and he rose, towering over the tiny car, startlingly, like a monarch emerged from a chrysalis. The horn clucked one, two, three compulsive chirps as he triple-pressed the remote lock, and his massive stride carried him up towards the house. And last, she was puttering down the lakeside parkway in a loud, rusted old thing 
and she would get there when she got there. Frank tended to speak as little as possible. Joey had learned to follow the direction his eyes took as they scanned a foundation for cracks, to watch as his palms slid across a baseboard, feeling for rot. Uh, knob and tube, he'd say, with no implication, pointing a finger in the vicinity of some exposed wiring in someone's basement. Joey would write it down, mainly for something to do. Frank made no judgments, offered no suggestions about or predictions as to the longevity of. Facts were recorded and liabilities were waived as Joey's quick young fingers swept across his clipboard. Chris stood quite a few feet back, thumbing the blue screen of his phone, stepping sideways over the groans of 19th century lacquered yellow pine, following the inspector and his scribbling apprentice. Chris's fiery impatience cooled as he watched Frank work, in efficient silence, wasting no one's time with words. He would continue to hire Frank as long as it was legally required for him to do so, or until he found someone who could do a job quicker, or with an even more vanishing interest in chit-chat. They were nearly finished with the first floor by the time Linda's silhouette appeared behind the front door's frosted glass. Chris waited for the silence to break. The door jam ground its weathered teeth. She clattered in with wings of handbags that fanned out from the crooks of her elbows. She dropped the heap of her luggage as if she expected a rushing body to bend to her heels and lug it around in a crouch behind her. Christopher, she acknowledged, dragging out the opening syllable theatrically. He looked up, blinked, and his eyes returned to his screen. She picked up one of her bags and click-clacked through the hallway to the rear of the house without another word, leaving the door hanging wide open. Chris thought he felt something bristle on his left earlobe as she passed, but then he thought he hadn't. Joey, staring at the two of them like zoo animals, walked over to shut the front door once it was clear that no one else would. Meanwhile, the house leaned into the wind. It squatted, a magnificent piece of beachfront real estate, a decaying tenement for mice and cobwebs. They were here to pick it apart. In the fall, a widow had been found stiff in the upstairs front bedroom. The family's dawdling grief, and then the auction, and then the arguments, and then the dragging of the dumpster across the front lawn meant that by the time they'd emptied the place enough to assess what they had, Winter had arrived. And here they were, in another drafty late-century craftsman, huddled inside their coats, investors awaiting their findings, checking for leaks. Linda swept into the kitchen, her vision alit. Rosewood for the cabinets, or maybe walnut, but something dark because of the contrast with the exquisite floor. God, keep the floor intact, and space out enough room for the hood of the stainless range and add an island in the center and maybe a half wall, and granite over everything. Her gloved leather fingertips grazed softly over the surfaces she appointed for demolition. She usually loved this part, stepping through a room, quietly but for the symphony bursting inside her head, an outstretched arm, a casual wrist bringing the place down to the studs. She would have schemed, committing none of her unraveling thoughts to paper, unconcerned with measurements or details of execution, her plan expanding like a map that only she could read. She would have proposed a brief outline to Christopher and waited and watched his face as he decided which of this building's structural deficiencies he'd choose to lie to her about. But today she couldn't seem to locate, she couldn't shrink from some unseen gaze. <laughs> 
With each breath, there was left a bit of stale air at the bottom of her lungs, like the pressure in the house was too great to fully exhale. And of course, there was puttering Twyla, whose joke of a vehicle was probably broken down at the side of an icy road somewhere. She would, as always, show up late, apologize too many times, take too long, and then mumble through her summary. Linda had spent time in a lot of creepy old houses, but this space had an intensity to it that made her wish Twyla would hurry the fuck up. She held her breath, listening for a voice, yearning for something to call itself to her attention. But remaining deaf to the frequency, she felt nothing but a vague, elemental fear of the creaking, empty space. Joey's flat feet padded down the wooden steps. It felt like these rooms had been carved out of limestone and flung from far away, landing on a dune near the lake shore. He felt that this was what it was trying to tell him, that his intrusion had caught it in the act of a lie or an embarrassing daydream. He felt its projection upon what he could see and touch, and he understood that it, like any compulsive liar, would tell him more in its telling than in its tale. It began as a premonition, and then it was gone. It had never been. Maybe. And yet he had been drawn to the cellar. No, no, the basement. Don't listen to its grandiosity. You're in a shallow, dingy basement. It was the basement that spoke to him the most earnestly, with the most whimpering cover-up. With the most to lose. Built foolishly on a bed of sand, water encroaching year-round from three sides, the house lay here on its belly, and the breached basement, too damp to be of use, heckled its intruders with its wails of self-justification. So they had come down here first, before the second floor like they normally would. It made no difference to Frank, and he followed Joey down the stairs like an old dog. Their boots sank into the mildewy floor. Mm, pipes, Frank murmured without elaboration, and held up a cupped palm while depressing an index finger, indicating that he wanted a picture taken of the spot. The flash of a diode lit the place in a piercing, unfamiliar light, and Joey felt something shudder from within a deep slumber, or maybe he saw something scatter from the edges of his vision. Frank, kneeling in the far corner to inspect the remnants of a French drain, arose and swept a hand across the sill of a thin, blotchy window. Oh, compromise seal, he said to anyone that was listening. Chris rocked from side to side on aching knees, burrowed into the glow of an email. Wearing shoes that cost more than most of the pieces of furniture Linda would pick out to fill this place back up, he would not be found skulking around in some mucky basement. His thumbs tapped furiously, engrossed, while the blur of a figure swept past a window that looked out onto the front porch. Chris pressed a finger and thumb into his eyelids, fuming for one of many reasons, and he poked select, and then trash. Linda's shoes clawed their way back through the cavernous hallway towards him. Facing the ashy fireplace, he could not see the huddled figure rise up to peer through the glass at his back. Linda screamed. Chris looked up, inconvenienced. Linda's hand pressed against her chest, and she panted. Do you see? She gasped, but the shade was gone from the window. He stared at her, puzzled. 
as if she were on display in a museum. But he didn't have time to guess, and he followed her eyes to the door and lunged toward it and flung it open. Who the fuck are you? He demanded immediately of something out of Linda's view. Oh, Jesus Christ, Twyla! Linda, realizing her mistake, sliding beneath Christopher's arching armpit and grabbing at the woman. You scared us half to death! What the hell were you doing staring out the window like some vagrant? She pulled her inside. The first thing you're going to do is Windex your greasy nose print off of that pane of glass. The doorbell didn't work, came Twyla's mousy defense, but no one was listening. The bottle is under the sink with a rag, and you're not on the clock until you're finished. Chris watched the odd woman scamper down the hallway. He'd noticed first her smell, otherworldly but difficult to place, like an exotic spice he'd never tasted, and then her face... Eyes sunken and downcast, cranial features melted into a permanent droop. And now, as she walked past, he stared at her clothes. Not clothes, really, but garments. She was wrapped in an indefinite number of shimmering pieces of cloth that she lifted like the trail of a dress as she moved. She looked like she had been dressed by a costume designer, like she might keep a crystal ball in her glove compartment. She turned the corner out of sight, but not out of earshot, jangling with dozens of bracelets, necklaces, and earrings. Who the fuck was that? Chris asked again, not used to waiting. And you're late! Linda called from where she stood, eyelids narrowed and taut. Who- Don't you raise your voice, Linda spoke in a dramatically lowered tone. Her diction morphed almost irreconcilably as she turned from servant to peer. She paused, just to make him wait. She held his gaze, trying to appear fearless, as he glared at her. That is Twyla, my divinist. After a moment, he croaked. Your... Divinist, Christopher. One who practices divination. When she didn't continue... He began. I know what- She can read your palm if you'd like, Linda interrupted, slipping her leathered fingers into his with a practiced seduction that he found disturbing, given her age. One of his eyebrows flattened and he straightened his back, looking to reclaim dominance in the conversation through posture. He pulled his hand away and snaked it back into his pocket in search of his phone, choosing to say nothing. Oh, you're no fun, she replied, mimicking hurt and then gliding away to the dining room. Twyla's cloaks billowed their way past, but Chris had decided to spend the rest of the day staring determinedly into the screen in his cupped hands. Well, basement's a mess, said Frank as he wiped off his boots with a towel at the top of the stairs. Linda, whose back was turned. Don't tell me, darling. He's the one who needs to sell the place. Gesturing towards the front room. Twyla wiped frantically, whipping her head around in both directions like a frightened rabbit under a nest of matted hair. She'd never heard a house speak with so much force, with such intimate proximity to language. After leading rich white women through so many boring, dusty suburban homes, following only the occasional flitting puff of a confused spirit, she had begun to lose faith, slowly, to see through the tattered holes in her once crafty hoax. Cheap jewelry clanged on her wrists as she reached down for the spray bottle. Even from the porch she could feel the hairs on her forearms prickle, the potential energy, the sizzling aura of this place that could be an entrance or an exit. She was afraid, because this feeling was beyond her experience. The character she played for these women chose always to appease, to surrender, but from where she knelt she had no guesses as to what it wanted. She did not want to go back into the house. She wanted desperately to go back into the house.
A dish falls to the floor and shatters somewhere above them. Linda, poised with a burst of fear and the determination not to show it, throws her head around like a tether ball and feels something pop in her neck. The other four of them, as if coordinated, look together to the top of the staircase. Eh, thought this place had been cleared out, said Frank the first one to speak. Chris, who had hired a couple of men that didn't speak English to empty the house of the widow's belongings, clenched his teeth in fury. When they'd finished their job in half the promised time, Chris had offered them only half of what they'd agreed upon, assuming their laziness. But the men took their money and didn't argue, and he couldn't convince them to come back to do anything else. Could have been mice. Frank continued when no one else would. Joey, grab a broom. And he started up the stairs. Chris followed, mind racing as he imagined arranging for a deportation. The stairs sighed under unfamiliar weight, a rhythmic molasses laugh that punctuated each step. Twyla, who hadn't heard anything from outside, turned the door handle just as the man rounded the second flight, and Linda sprang backwards. God damn it, Twyla! She gasped, with a hand pressed into the ridge of her throbbing neck. Twyla imagined slowly strangling the woman. What? Where did... She responded, intuiting the answer, and then she bolted up the stairs. Linda who would absolutely not be left down here by herself, hobbled after, calling for Twyla to stop with the desperate futility of an owner chasing an unleashed pet. By the time she reached the top of the groaning stairs, she had to swivel her entire body to peer down the hall in each direction, the muscles in her neck clamping like a bear trap. Eyes bubbling with tears, she paused, steeling herself with a mantra she'd adopted in her many years fighting through life in a man's world. Don't be a pussy, Linda. And the muscles in her jaw hardened. Even though she couldn't speak to it, even though she was not attuned to listen for its response, she shuddered with a tremulous fear, knowing that something was with her in this uncharted place. She gazed in each direction and felt that the house had become bigger than she knew it to be, felt herself at the blurring edge of a focal point as a camera panned out, wider and wider. She had no way to tell in the stillness which way they had turned. With clammy palms, she slid her red gloves along the wall for stability and for the comfort of a practiced motion pain now arcing its way through her vertebrae and into her hamstrings, she limped into the inflating darkness. Twyla couldn't believe her luck when she found it. Somehow, although just a few steps behind the men on the stairs, she had turned in a different direction that had led her to the front bedroom. She tapped on the closed wooden door, and the silence with which its hinges gave way stole her breath. She towed through the threshold, feeling the room part around her like a sea. The room was empty. She could see four ingrained welts in the floorboards where the bedposts had bitten through the urethane, and it was into that rectangle that she felt drawn. It was in there. She didn't know by how much she could break character, didn't know the measure of herself beneath its looming presence. She placed her usual trinkets around the baseboards at the edges of the room, 
anchors, so she could retain her bearings inside of what was to come. And then she saw it, or it was revealed to her. It lay in scattered pieces at her feet, like it had been pushed and had fallen from nowhere. Chris had made himself a success through perseverance, not circumstance. And when he told the story of his rise, under the pretense of modesty at dinner parties, he would often use the phrase, the inability to surrender. He plodded through the voluminous second floor between Frank and his apprentice with this thought in mind. The place had, as far as he could see, been emptied, as promised. But it felt more than just empty. It felt expansive, drafty. The air wasn't moving, but it wouldn't sit still. He could see his breath in it. Ebbing as he strode heavy, it receded into his wake. Don't know where it could have tipped from, said Frank as they entered their third or fifth empty room. Joey looked around, dustpan in hand feeling himself nudged by some armless hand on the small of his back, deeper and deeper into the web of the house. Twyla picked up the shards, playing with them, turning them in her hands as she tried to reconstruct a puzzle from the half of the pieces that hadn't been lost. She looked back at her Celtic cross sitting in the distance, by a closet, a faintly gleaming tether in this vast expanse of space. The supple skin of a baby's finger lifted the tip of her nose, and she was looking out the window. It had gone dark, incrementally, and then in an instant, as happens after spending a long day inside and suddenly looking up from a desk filled with papers. Linda fumbled her way through the maze in an ambiguous, murky twilight that radiated with the haze of something waiting just beyond each successive corner. With her left hand pressing into the knotted muscle behind her ear, she pinched her knees to remove her right glove and better feel her way across the oily wall. Panic, building like a low-dose anesthetic, began to brim. Her nose was dripping, and her hair was a mess, and her eye makeup had smudged, and she could barely walk, and she had turned around a dozen times in the hours or weeks up here. Her lungs bucked with the frenzy of each passing breath. She had called out endlessly into the stillness, for Twyla, for Chris, for her mother now long dead. From where she found herself, they were, by now, miles away. It could feel her fear and her estrangement from its verbiage, from its guidance. It could feel within her the bubbling up of every nightmare that had woken her in childish sleep, she who of all of them feared it and denied it the most. It could feel her last defense crumble. It moved to convince her. All light went out, and her eyes were useless. The walls dripped, and the wet slithered down her fingernails and across her knuckles. In concert, her mouth began to salivate until she could no longer swallow, and she spat onto the floor. Footsteps, and she spun to meet the echo.
Twyla looked back down at the pieces in her hands, having seen what she had been shown. It waited, in this crucial moment, for her to accept its story and let it fully in. She teetered on its fence, thinking about her character and about the part she'd been asked to play. And then, for evidence, she slipped one of the unplaceable fragments into the cup of her bra, next to her heart. At this distance, neither knew who was in control. She gathered up her charms. She left the room, closing the door behind her, the way it had been. She found Linda sobbing in the middle of the gloomy hallway, hands over her eyes and batting at the air surrounding her. Twyla knelt down at her side, seeing but also wondering what the woman had been shown. She hauled upwards on Linda's lapel and brought her employer nearly upright. Linda, gazing into the many eyes of a wriggling, squid-like demon, wailed and collapsed back onto the floor. She could leave her here, she thought. They could find her, later, cold and stricken and sucked lifeless. It had happened before. From next to her heart, it engorged itself and, distracted, careless, it let something slip. From far away, Chris heard screams. He threw open a door and lurched with vertigo as he peered over a quavering ledge on some unexpected third floor he couldn't remember having reached. He turned around to look behind him, and he was alone. But oddly, down below, he spotted Linda, a slushy pile in the middle of the floor. He dove for the winding staircase that had appeared at his side. Frank stuck his head out of some other room, wondering what all the yelling was about. He saw Chris's face, for some reason high above him, dart backwards and out of view. His irises flexed and strained and landed on the wreck of Linda's crumpled body on the floor in front of him. With one mighty arm, he reached backwards for Joey's shirt, and with the other, he scooped Linda onto his shoulder, and by then, he could see that Twyla had already made it to the landing halfway down the stairs. They stood together in the driveway, beneath a frigid moon that doused the lake in an ancient light. They shifted on chilly ankles, standing and looking around, and coming to. Joey, who had been for the most part a passenger on their odd voyage, who'd today taken few actions for which he could be held accountable, felt his recognition dawn first. He asked, what was that up there? When most of them could still only wonder, up where? Twyla took a long time to think about it, and then spoke. Probably nothing. Joey stood, not recognizing the woman facing him. She turned to walk away. But I felt, I mean, I thought I could... His voice skidded as he looked up to see her recede, and then he skipped into a jog to catch her. Hey, wait, no. I can tell, I, I, can, I can tell you felt it too. Felt what? Without slowing, 
Uh, well, uh, uh... He wasn't sure. She indulged him. <laughs> a ghost? Laughing at his ignorance. Uh, something, he returned with Midwestern irresolution. There's no such thing as ghosts. Now she had reached her car. Now the door creaked as she wrenched it open. I felt like I was getting lost up there, said Joey, trying to hang on to the feeling of a dream whose once indelible details were fading in the cold light. You are confused. Now her door closed and her engine turned over. No, it couldn't have been nothing. Frank, did you... He let slide the tail of his question as he looked back down the driveway. Frank, who had nothing to hide, and therefore nothing to fear, was writing some final notes on a pad that Joey had once held distantly. Hmm, might set up some electric wires. And lead paint, he mumbled to himself. I can't... Uh... Joey protested. Does nobody... Chris, who had a great deal to hide, and therefore a great deal to fear, who had seen nothing, who had sealed himself inside a phalanx of denial, was already in his car at the bottom of the driveway. Performance tires squealed on salted asphalt, and he was gone. All right, now, ma'am, you go home and get some rest. I'll have Joey type up this report for you on Monday, Frank spoke over his shoulder as he climbed into the cab of his truck. The diesel engine roared and Joey's eyes widened, unable to believe what he was hearing. And then Frank was gone too. Linda stood facing the horizon as the snow began to fall, looking irretrievable. Twyla's car paused its reverse as it reached her. Ma'am, she began brusquely, fantasizing a playbill of characters and sinewy plot lines that this house could bring to life. Anything would feel real up there. You'll have my report in the morning. She couldn't quiet her frenzied brain, already scheming to lead in droves of women at double or triple her normal rate. Maybe she'd buy the place. Ma'am she said slowly. Go home now. Linda, in a state fit to obey only the simplest commands, looked down to find that a key ring had been placed in her trembling hands. It had been too much for her. Maybe it had been clumsy. She'd been set out in an unnavigable drift, on course to spend the next days and weeks spiraling with centripetal momentum outwards into madness. She backed over the mailbox, halogen slicing through the night. And then there were two. Wait, um, Joey called as he ran backwards towards the last car making its way away from the house. Boy, aren't you cold? Twyla called through a slit in her window. Go home to your parents. No, wait, hold on a minute. Confused as he found himself out of breath. I, I, I know I saw something up there. And he had. And she knew it. And it knew it inside her. What had it been? What was it that she had found? Some sinister clue? Some gun with a barrel emptying wafting smoke? Still pointed at its target in the moment everything had gone from right to wrong? A noose of twine for wrapping around a child's neck? Shattered pieces of a tiny porcelain hand? Maybe it was those things, you think knowing that you're not even close. You yearn for order, for the tidiness of right and wrong, for reason above all else, for the wailing revenge of an old widow's ghost 
for motive and transgression. For evil sprung from a decomposed good. But we do not create evil, you realize. We do not manufacture the good with which it can spar. There is no evil. There is only a choice made within the thick and twisted burls of a withered widow's aged mind. A mind that made the decision one day after years of whispers lilting from around corners to open itself up, to let it in, to let it warp, haunt, and terrorize. The house had turned against them as it had turned that one day on the poor old widow who never stood a chance. Twyla had stared down at its shards. She'd picked one up, turning it in her hands. The key, the explanation, the motive. And she'd absorbed it. Cornered, it bowed in propitiation to its new master. Twyla looked now at Joey, into the fat, beseeching spheres of his eyes. You think it would choose to show itself to you? Fangs bared, gaze darkened by a presence from an unknown world. Do I think it, it would... What? That was no spook camped out up there, waiting to frighten dogs and children. She felt it take over, felt it choose her words from its curled perch above her left breast. Things like that don't talk. They can't speak. And if they could, we wouldn't condescend to show ourselves to a know-nothing twit like you. A meaningful slip. The planned burst of an ego. It felt tiny and inadmissible, which is precisely how the lure slipped so discreetly into its prey's open mouth. A hook catches in a cheek. Then it closes off the words it had once fed to an old woman and now fed to a young woman and it throws the car into gear and Twyla careened down the driveway away from the house. Joey stood feeling the cold of the night, wondering what the hell everyone had been talking about today. He looked back at the unlit house, an acidic terror surged in his stomach. He sprinted to his pickup and prayed as the alternator ratcheted and sputtered, and he too peeled out onto the street. All it has to do now is tug softly on the line. Somewhere down the road, he slows, stops, and turns the car around. Joey climbs the steps onto the porch and twists the handle of the front door that they'd forgotten to lock on their way out. Linda's abandoned handbags have been removed. The lights they never turned off have been extinguished. He peers into the darkness of the empty house. Thunderclaps of blood pound through the arteries in his ears, but his resolution holds. Parlor room, hallway, kitchen, cellar door. He listens as his boots clunk on each step on the way down. His left touches the stone floor first, and then his right, and into the stillness he holds in front of him the faintness of a cell phone's glow. He is unsure which of them will make the first move. It begins as a premonition, and then it engulfs him. Or, he steps into it like a mist 
and then they are gone. This has been written and read by Episode 3, Deceit, by Nick Lamandola. Thanks so much for listening. Of course, this episode was brought to you by Woody.